I want to thank you for joining our winter Ozark Ag Series. My name is Kyle Whitaker. I'm a County Engagement Specialist in Agriculture and Environment with a focus on Ag Business. I'm assigned Webster, Texas and Wright County, housed in Webster County. Uh, the first presentation I'm making in this series is to do with feeder and slaughter cattle grades. Uh, so we'll be talking about what those are and what we as producers may need to know about them. First, I just kind of wanted to review the uh, phases of beef production. I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but I want to, I think it's important we kind of understand the cycle of beef production. The first phase would be a cow-calf operation. They could really be of two types, a purebred or seed stock cow-calf operator or a commercial cow-calf operator. Uh, both of these would manage a cow herd, so they each on a daily basis, they would be focused on the the herd health, uh, herd nutrition, uh, a breeding program, uh, certainly at the onset of their offspring's uh, lives, most of the gain is going to be achieved on uh, grass or forage and milk. So there's some importance on the mothering ability of these females and milking ability so that uh, we can raise a calf crop. Uh, some of the differences are a purebred seed stock producer is likely going to focus on uh, one one breed, probably a pure breed, and they're going to grow their offspring to maturity. So they're going to be marketing uh, breeding age bulls that could be purchased by other sea stock producers or oftentimes uh, purchased by a cow-calf operator and also uh, supplying replacement females uh, to the herd. A cow-calf uh, operation commercial, uh, they're going to more than likely going to be selling a feeder calf, a wean calf, seven to eight months of age. So they're just really raising their offspring uh, from birth to wean. From there, the feeder calves will move on to what's called a, uh, a stocker or backgrounding operation. Uh, here, there is no cow herd to manage. Uh, they're simply purchasing uh, feeder calves. So they're getting these uh, feeder calves in at about seven or eight months of age, and they're going to grow them to that yearling or, or a long yearling a 12 to age of 12 to 14 months. So they're going to get these cattle in that five to 600 pound weeding weight range and take them to seven to 900 pounds. Uh, here gain is mainly achieved on roughages. We're not going to be feeding these cattle a lot of grain, uh, partly because we just want to give these cattle time to mature. First of all, the cattle aren't big enough uh, to produce uh, the size of retail cut that the market demands or the American consumer wants, and they're not mature enough to begin finishing or depositing fat, and certainly depositing fat inside the muscle called marbling that we want. So during this phase of production, it's important that we just simply give these uh, cattle time to mature. So their rate of gain here uh, is not near as high as what we'll see uh, when we get these cattle uh, into the feed yard. And that is the last phase of beef production. Uh, is the feedlot. And so uh, they're going to purchase these cattle from a stocker operator. So they're coming into this feedlot at that seven to 900 pounds, and they're going to grow them to a finished weight. And that finished weight could be anywhere really between a thousand or 1400 pounds. Uh, here, we uh, are going to feed them uh, some grain. We're going to feed these animals a, a, a high energy diet. And that's because excess energy is stored as fat. And that's what we're wanting. We want to get these cattle fat or what, what we might refer to as being finished. So cattle are typically in the feed yard for 100 to 150 days. Uh, then they'll leave there. They'll be purchased uh, by the slaughter facility uh, to go ahead and be harvested into uh, wholesale cuts or primal cuts that are boxed and referred to as boxed beef uh, and then uh, sent throughout uh, the country uh, to grocery stores, restaurants, etc. So our first uh, topic that I want to tackle tonight is uh, feeder cattle grades. And so really if feeder cattle grades are, are determined by evaluating uh, three uh, characteristics, and that is uh, frame size, thickness, and thriftiness. Uh, frame size is just uh, you know, the skeletal measurement that considers the height and body length of, of an animal or calf in this case in relation to its age. Thickness is just refers to the development of the animal's muscling in relation to their skeletal size. And then thriftiness uh, is just a general uh, appraisal of the apparent health of the animal 
and its ability to grow and fatten normally. So uh, in essence, uh, what a feeder calf grade is, it is simply a prediction of what type of fed animal this calf will become. What kind of animal will this feeder calf, that's is seven to eight months of age, when it is a year and a half and it's coming out of a feedlot after being on feed for 150 days, what does that animal look like? And more importantly, what type of carcass is that animal going to produce when we go ahead and, and harvest them? So feeder cattle grades standards at least were mandated uh, by the Agriculture Marketing Act of 1946. And there's been several changes to the feeder calf uh, grade standards. Uh, the most recent one was in October of 2000. And basically what they did at that time was to add a fourth muscling score uh, to the feeder cattle grades. So uh, feeder cattle grades are a really valuable tool for marketing cattle and calves uh, and certify the grades uh, of the cattle that are being used in contracts uh, for futures markets. So it, it, uh, it kind of begs the question, why were feeder cattle grades established? Well, probably the number one reason is so that we establish this common language between buyers and sellers so that the buyers uh, know what they're buying and, and sellers understand uh, what they're selling and to establish this uniform reporting system. So if you've ever heard a market report or looked at a market report uh, on feeder cattle, uh, they are reported by their feeder cattle grade. A market report might say, uh, large frame number one, uh, large and medium frame number one steers and heifers were steady to two dollars higher, etc. Another reason that uh, we maybe changed, uh, had all these revisions to these feeder cattle grades is around the 1960s we got a pretty big influx of European breeds or uh, some people refer to them as continental breeds, simply breeds from the continent of Europe. Uh, so when those cattle come in, they were typically larger frame than the British breeds of Angus, Hereford, and Shorthorn that pretty much dominated the beef industry in the United States. Uh, and they tended to be a little heavier muscle. So when we brought in breeds like Simmental, Charlay, Gelvy, uh, there was this need to make sure that we were establishing these grades so that we have this common language and this common expectation of how, how we expect these calves to grow and what type of fed cattle and carcasses they will produce uh, later on in their life. So really the process of uh, grading feeder cattle is a projection of maturity uh, based on their frame size, muscling, and to some extent the sex of, their, uh, the, sex of the calf. So let's talk about this uh, maturity because really remember what a feeder calf grade is, is a prediction of what kind of fed animal or what kind of carcass this feeder calf will produce when it comes out of that feed yard at 18 months of age or so, uh, weighing that 1,000 to 1,400 pounds. So they begin to finish and deposit fat because of maturity, not because of what they weigh. So animals deposit fat in a sequence. The first place they deposit fat is around their organs, which is referred to as kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. The second place they would deposit fat is on the outside of the muscle or just underneath the skin. So on a live animal, we would call that subcutaneous fat. On a carcass, we would call it external fat. Finally, the last place they deposit fat is inside the muscling or what's called intramuscular fat or marbling. And that is what we're looking for. We want these cattle uh, to grade at least low choice carcass. That's what the market demands. That's what the consumer demands. And they're going to begin to marble, not because of what they weigh, but because where they're at uh, in their growth curve. So they're not going to begin to deposit fat until uh, they're mature enough to do so. So when we get them in that feed yard and they're mature enough to, to begin to deposit fat and in particular marbling, that's why we feed them a high energy diet because that excess energy will then be converted into fat, which is what we're wanting to put in these cattle and on these cattle in order to get the quality of the retail cuts produced uh, where we want them to be. So I think it's important as we talk about maturity and assigning a feeder calf grade that we understand the difference between uh, growth and development. So growth can be defined as just the change in size and weight. Uh, 
this is something we can notice as we go out and take care of our cattle every day or certainly notice over time. Uh, growth occurs by two processes. Uh, one is hypertrophy, which is simply the increase in the size of cells. And the other is hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of cells. Both processes end up in this increase in size and weight. Development, on the other hand, can be uh, best defined maybe as a change in body shape and form. So I have two silhouettes at the bottom of this slide. The one on the left is a heifer calf and the one on the right is a mature cow. So the idea here is the silhouettes are the same size. So we're taking growth out of the equation. Can't really see any difference in size and weight, but we can obviously see that there's a big change in body shape and form. And that is happening not because of what the animal weighs, but where they're at in terms of their growth curve. Uh, as they mature, their body shape and form changes. And in this case, as feeder cattle mature, they become mature enough to begin depositing fat, and in particular, that intramuscular fat or marbling, which is what we want, and that's why we call those cattle finished, uh, because they have enough finish on them to have enough intramuscular fat or marbling uh, to grade low choice. It's the same reason why a female would begin to have a heat cycle is because uh, they've reached maturity or sexual maturity and they are simply old enough uh, to have a heat cycle. So if we think about growth curves and we look at this particular calf here at the top of this slide, as this calf grows, he's increasing in frame, he's increasing in muscle, and then finally they're going to start increasing in fat. And so this is a, a big steer here weighing 1,400 pounds before it was mature enough to begin to, depositing, to deposit fat in the, on the outside of the muscle and inside the muscle or intramuscular fat is marbling. We compare that down here to this heifer, a smaller framed animal, and uh, she stops growing at about 900 pounds and start uh, putting on uh, fat on the outside of her muscle and marbling. And typically that's true. Typically heifers are earlier maturing and would get finished, what we would say finished, at a smaller weight than steers because steers are later maturing compared to their uh, female counterpart. So when we start assigning feeder cattle grades, we're actually doing two things. We're giving them a frame score of large, medium, or small, and then a muscling score, either one, two, three, or four. When we're evaluating the frame size, this is where we're evaluating the maturity of this animal. Is this animal later maturing, meaning it's going to grow for a longer period of time before it matures and begins to deposit fat, which would result in a finished animal at a larger weight when compared to an earlier maturing animal, an animal that would simply mature earlier in life, therefore would begin to uh, deposit fat and become finished at a lower uh, body weight than one that is later maturing. So as we look at these uh, six to 800 pound feeder calves uh, and we're trying to evaluate what their frame score might be and predict whether they're in this late maturing or earlier maturing, whether they're going to grow for a longer period of time or whether they're going to grow uh, for a shorter period of time before they're mature, there's a couple of things we can look at. We can just look and see how elevated uh, they are at their chest floor, so we just can kind of compare uh, how much space we have between the chest and the ground. Another good indicator is to look at just general body length, so we can compare them from the foreflank to the hind flank, and then just hip height. And if you look at this particular calf, and we're not comparing one calf to another, we're comparing this calf's skeletal measurements relative to his age to come up with a frame score. This is a youthful looking calf. It's got quite a bit of body length, uh, looks to have quite a bit of leg underneath it, a calf that looks like it's gonna grow uh, for quite a while before uh, it begins to mature enough at least to deposit fat. The other thing that uh, we need to know about these frame sizes and, and in a feeder calf grade is really what are they telling us? So if we look here on the left, steers, uh, if we give a large frame score to a feeder calf in a feeder calf grade, we are basically saying that this animal is later maturing. It is going to mature later in life. 
And so therefore, it's going to grow for a longer period of time, and it is going to be larger when it finishes. And what are we calling finished? Well, we're calling finished at that four tenths to a half an inch of back fat, because that's likely how much back fat that this animal is going to need to have before it's going to have enough marbling inside that ribeye for that carcass to grade low choice. If we give a feeder calf a medium frame score, then we're saying that this animal is going to be finished or have this amount of back fat and marbling is desired at a weight between 1,100 and 1,250 pounds. And if we give it a small frame score, we're saying that this animal is quicker or earlier maturing and will finish in terms of fat cover and marbling at a live weight of under 1,100 pounds. Now, if you look at the heifers over here, we've already mentioned that heifers are typically earlier maturing uh, than, than, their, than their male counterparts. And if we look at this, that, that is still true. It's saying if we have a large frame heifer, a heifer calf, a heifer feeder calf, and we give it a large frame score, that heifer is probably going to grow to over 1,150 pounds before she's finished. Uh, if we have a medium frame uh, score on a heifer feeder calf, we're saying that when that animal has enough fat cover that we can call it finished and it's likely going to grade low choice when we slaughter it, it's going to be between that 1,000 to 1,150 pounds and a small frame would be under 1,000 pounds. So the next thing we need to look at when we're talking about feeder cattle grades is how to evaluate muscle. And so if we look at this, uh, this calf here, we might want to look right through the center of its quarter or what you might call stifle the stifle. It's a good indication of width because remember uh, muscle is how much muscle development there is relative to their skeleton. So if we have a wider skeleton, we're more likely going to be able to put more muscle in that wider skeleton. We can also look up here at the hip and if we've got a wide, a wide pin set in this hip, we tend to have more width in this rump and it's going to be flatter looking uh, from that tail head over to their uh, hook or pin bone. I think it's important we also look right down at the ground, kind of look at that base width. And so we can see this is making a, uh, a pretty wide rectangle here, which is an indication that this animal has uh, some muscle. And remember that muscle is attached to that skeleton. So the skeleton, uh, what, how the skeleton is made or designed affects how much muscle that calf can have. If we compare that over here uh, to this calf, certainly you can see it's got a lot less muscle and we get a totally different shape. An animal is almost wider up top than it is when we look down at its base, uh, uh, certainly a lot narrower from stifle to stifle. And we almost get this triangular shape when we're studying how much width of hip we have and how wide their pin set is when we look at the animal from the rear view, which indicates this animal is significantly lighter muscled uh, than the white calf we have on the same slot. So in a feeder calf grade, uh, there are four muscle scores. One is considered to be thick or heavy muscled, uh, two is an average muscling, and three is a thin or light muscling, and four is extremely light muscled. So it, it would be a light muscled dairy animal might fall in to that number four muscling score. So here's an example of a, of a couple of number one muscles uh, calves. The one on the left falls into that high one category, and then the black calf on the right is a low one, meaning it's close to being a number two muscling or what we might call a high two. Here's a number two muscling. Again, on the left, we have a high two. Uh, which is a little bit more muscling. We might go ahead and put this feeder calf up into the number one muscling score. And then we have an example of a low two, meaning it's close to a number three muscling. This slide, we're showing you a high three muscling score and a low three muscling score. And then here's the number four muscling score, uh, extremely thin. And here they are all together. And so we can uh, just look at this different shape that we're getting when we compare that right through the center of their hind quarter or stifle to stifle compared to their base width. Uh, this is an indication of how much skeletal width we have and therefore how much muscle development uh, that this feeder calf has. So the possible feeder calf grades, there's 13 of them. They could either be a large frame number one or a large frame number two, a large frame number three or a large frame number four 
And then that carries on through the medium frame with the four muscle scores, the small frame with the four muscle scores. And then we could have an inferior grade. And this would include cattle that are just sick or unthrifty, or what we some people refer to as double muscled cattle, because double muscled cattle or cattle with hypertrophy simply uh, don't de never deposit enough external fat to deposit marbling inside the muscle, so they have no opportunity uh, for grading that low choice quality grade that we're looking for. And so those feeder calves would be considered inferior because they are never going to be finished at any weight. Another thing I think it's important for us to look at when we're considering this frame size uh, relative to age and their skeletal uh, measurement and their muscle is uh, what else about the animal tells us this animal is youthful and has got a lot of grow left or is quick maturing. And so here's a picture of a calf that uh, probably doesn't weigh a whole lot, uh, but one that's got some indicators this calf is much older than it should be. And so therefore, we probably need to lower its frame score. I think a good place to look is just look at that overall tail length. For a younger calf, a feeder calf, and that's seven to eight months age, that tail shouldn't be distended way down past the hock like you see on this calf. You're going to see a lot of twist in that switch of the tail, which just simply means this calf is older than you might think. We can look right up in their face. We've seen one that's wide muzzled, maybe one that has some coarse hair over their pole. And so this is the kind of feeder calf that order buyers will see. A lot of people probably have a calf that just didn't grow very well, and it's a lot older, and they'll throw it in with younger calves that are just weaned, hoping that it won't, it'll pass but uh, I can assure you most order buyers are going to find those kind of cattle and probably are not going to buy them. The other thing I think it's important when we're talking about predicting this maturity or projection of maturity uh, is to just look at how much fat conditioning or fleshing ability that a feeder calf may have. Now this smoky colored steer here, uh, if we were just to evaluate its frame size, it's maybe one that we could probably put into that large frame category fairly easily. It's got some elevation from the ground to its chest floor. It's got an adequate amount of length from that fore rib to hind rib. But here's a calf that's starting to show some signs of, of finishing or some condition. If we look uh, here on either side of its tail head, it's pin bones called the pones. We're starting to see a little fat condition. And we can also see some fat deposition happening here in the brisket. Uh, so this may be a good indicator that this calf is earlier maturing and so therefore we may want to drop that frame score from what we might have considered to be a large frame calf feeder calf drop that down to a medium okay so this is your opportunity to see uh what you've learned here so i'm going to show you some feeder calves and have you assign a feeder calf grade to them and so remember a feeder calf grade is a frame score of either large medium or small and a muscle score of either one, two, three, or four. So each feeder calf grade is going to have to have one of those frame scores and one of those muscling scores. So here's a heifer calf that weighs 650 pounds. There's a side view. So from this side view, we can kind of start looking at that elevation from the ground to the chest floor, the length of side, and just make a prediction of how much more we think this animal is going to grow before they're mature enough to begin depositing fat and become what we refer to as a finished animal. And here's a rear view. We really kind of need to see this rear view in order to put on, uh, or make a prediction of what the muscling score would be. So I'm gonna pause for just a little bit and let you uh, think about what feeder calf grade you might assign this particular calf. This is a good example, I think, of a large frame number three uh, feeder calf, uh, certainly large frame and one that uh, is fairly light muscled, so we probably need to put down into that uh, number three muscling score. So here's another a feeder calf. This is a steer that weighs 750 pounds. Here's a rear view, so you can think about what the muscle score might be. And so go ahead and make a prediction of, of what kind of feeder calf grade you think it would get. I think this is a good example of a large frame number one feeder calf. Maybe a calf that you're looking at and thinking uh, 
I see some evidence of, of some fleshing and finishing going on, uh, but as much muscle as this calf has, that's an indication it's got quite a bit of grow uh, left before uh, it's going to mature and start depositing fat. Here's a, another calf. It's a steer calf, weighs 520 pounds. Here's a rear view. Give you just a, a moment or two to see what you think the feeder calf grade might be on this one. I call it a medium frame number two. It's a pretty common calf that we might see going through an auction here in Southwest Missouri, a black baldy calf. Uh, I think we need to go a medium frame here uh, simply because we're starting to get a little bit more middle and just not as youthful looking as some of the other calves we saw. So this is a type of frame uh, of, a, of a feeder calf that we'd expect uh, to probably mature a little bit earlier uh, than a large frame steer. Here's a steer that weighs 475 pounds. Here's a rear view. Like this is a good small frame number two. Here's a calf that for 475 pounds sure has quite a bit of mature look to it. If you look up at this calf's head, it's pretty wide muzzled, pretty short face, one that's got quite a bit of middle, uh, one that's fairly short to the ground, short bodied if we're looking at length to side. So one that falls into that small frame category and is a, a number two muscle. So here's a, another one. Here's a heifer calf weighing 810 pounds. Maybe it looks like it's got some dairy influence in it. And then here's a rear view. So we can kind of put on a muscling score. I'd call this definitely a large frame and a number three muscling. And we mentioned earlier, typically heifers are earlier maturing. Uh, but most dairy animals uh, are going to be in that large frame category. They might not if we're talking about a jersey, but uh, most dairy animals are going to be in that large frame category. This particular heifer looks like uh, she's pretty free of fat and uh, very youthful looking up through her front one third. Looks like a heifer has got quite a bit of grow left in her, even though she already weighs 810 pounds. So we'd expect her to be in that large frame uh, for, a, for a heifer coming out of the feed yard before she's mature enough to have enough fat that we can call her finished. Here's a little Hereford heifer, 635 pounds. And here's a rear view. Like this is a good example of a medium frame number two or a feeder calf score a medium number two. Uh, here's a, this little Hereford heifer is a little bit shorter couple, a little bit shorter bodied. Uh, one that just has that look like she's a little quicker or earlier maturing and will reach uh, that finished weight uh, smaller than one of its counterparts that, might, that we might consider to be large frame. Here's a steer weighing in at 690 pounds. Here's a rear view so you can assess the muscle to give a muscle score. And so go ahead and make a prediction on what you think the feeder calf's grade would be for this particular calf. Going to go to medium frame number one here. I think this is a good example. If we just study the, the skeletal measurements of this particular calf, look at elevation from that chest or from the ground to the chest floor and length of side. Uh, here's one that you can think, well, that easily would fit into that large category. However, if you look at this calf, we're starting to see some evidence of fat. If we look through its brisket uh, down its top line, uh, at, a steer that's got quite a bit of middle to it indicates that's an indication that's a little bit more mature. It's an awful heavy muscled calf, but uh, one uh, I think is going to fall into that medium category just because we're starting to see some evidence of, of some finish uh, on this calf already at, 609, at 690 pounds. Another steer at 600 pounds, a rear view of that steer, it's like a crossbred steer. It's a good example of a medium frame number two muscling. This calf is just simply shorter coupled. Uh, looks like it's a little quicker earlier maturing as we study its skeletal measurements and look at that front one third and a steer that falls into that number two uh, muscling score pretty handily. And we've got a steer here. It looks like a dairy influence steer at 605 pounds. Here's a rear view of that steer. I'll give you just a minute to think about 
uh, what you think the feeder calf grade might be. I think this is a good example of a medium frame number four, certainly a good example of a number four muscling, uh, but medium frame. If we study this uh, skeletal measurements of this particular dairy steer, you might think, well, that, that calf's pretty elevated from the floor to, from the ground to its chest floor, one that's got quite a bit of body length. Why didn't we call it a, a large frame? Well, I think there's some evidence of fleshing here, especially for a dairy animal. A dairy animal will reach that uh, m enough marbling to grade low choice at about half the amount of external fat uh, that it takes a, for a beef animal to get to that low choice, uh, enough marbling to be considered low choice. So this particular steer looks like it's starting to put on some finish and we probably need to drop that frame score down from a large to a medium. Here's a steer weighing in at 810 pounds. Here's a rear view of that steer. This is just really a pretty good example of a large frame number one uh, feeder calf. Uh, steer's got quite a bit of body length. If we look at it from the side, it extended up through its front. One that's uh, got a lot of muscle and doesn't have a, a whole lot of evidence of, of fat cover yet, and certainly falls into that number one muscling score. Here's another steer weighing in at 685 pounds. Here's a rear view of that steer. I'll give you just a second to think about what kind of feeder calf grade you would assign this one. It's a really good example of a medium frame number one uh, feeder calf grade. And so if we look at the skeleton of this particular steer, shorter to the ground, shorter coupled, uh, one that's starting to get a little bit more middle, so we need to put it in that medium frame category and one that is a number one muscling, but probably on the low side of number one muscling. So we talked earlier about uh, an inferior grade and so uh, cattle that are a lot of people refer to as double muscled, which is uh, really not correct. It's not like uh, those cattle have one muscle on top of another or have twice as much muscle as other calves do. It is that process we referred to earlier as hypertrophy, which is just simply an increase in the size of the muscle cells. Uh, but these cattle are often or almost always graded inferior in terms of a feeder calf because they do not have the ability to finish and will never have enough marbling to reach that low choice quality grade. Uh, so they're given the inferior grade. So how does these feeder calf grades uh, affect the prices? Well, here's some price, uh, some prices, some feeder calf uh, market report from a couple of weeks ago. If you look at the top of this, you can see uh, that our uh, medium frame, uh, large, uh, medium and large frame feeder calves, that number one score. And if we look at this five to 600 pound weight, we've got a price range here of a, of a, of a low of $1.55 uh, per pound or $155 per hundred up to $170 per hundred. If we take those frames, same frame scores, but drop down to a number two muscling, we're in this 121 to uh, $138 a hundred. So that's a pretty significant difference. So the market uh, and the order buyers out buying these cattle, they like those cattle to have that amount of muscle because later on when we hang this carcass up, that muscle is going to help them with yield grade. Uh, and so they're interested in having some muscle on these cattle. We all know that if we take our heifer calves to the sale barn, they just bring less than our steer calves. And part of that is, is because this fact that they mature earlier. When we take these, uh, these heifer calves and we put them in a feed yard, and they're gonna be finished and gonna be slaughtered at a smaller weight. So therefore we're gonna have a smaller carcass weight. We simply just have less pounds of retail cuts uh, that we're able to market from that. So they're gonna bring less. So if you look here in that five to 600 pound weight, uh, we're in that $1.24, uh, maybe up to a, a, a $1.4150 a pound or $1.42 a hundred or so on the high end. Uh, so, and that's a number one muscling, large and medium frame. So I want to move on and talk a little bit about slaughter cattle grades, because remember the feeder calf grades are predicting what kind of slaughter cattle these calves are going to be. So in essence, it's predicting what are their slaughter cattle grades. So grades of slaughter cattle are intended to be di directly related to the grade of the carcass that they produce. And so really to do that, uh, 
to accomplish that, they're based on two factors. One of them is just simply what we would call the quality or palatability, uh, the expected taste. And so indicating characteristics of the lean, uh, and that is referred to as quality grade. So carcasses are assigned a quality grade. And then we need to kind of look at what the quantity or cutability of a particular carcass would be or a prediction of what the percent or the amount of trimmed uh, boneless retail cuts that we can get from a carcass, and that is referred to as a yield grade. So when we're talking about fed cattle, and this can be a little bit confusing if you're listening to market reports, but fed cattle are also referred to as fat cattle, or also referred to as live cattle, also referred to as slaughter cattle. They're marketed primarily by three methods, and those methods are live weight, or what we call a dressed weight or a carcass weight, meaning in a live weight, the, the seller is paid so much per pound for what the animal uh, weighed live. In a dress weight, the seller is paid so much per pound for what the carcass weight of that animal was. And the last method is what's referred to as a grid or formula, where the uh, seller is paid on how good the carcass is. What was the quality grade of that carcass? What was the yield grade of that carcass? So it's important, I think, for us to know that even live price is based on a grid formula pricing when cattle are marketed through an auction uh, or they're being purchased through what's called a bid price or a cash negotiated price. Now, what I mean by that is when packers buy a pen of cattle live, they are predicting what kind of grid and formula those cattle are going to be. How good is the quality grade and yield grade uh, going to be? So they're taking into account when they when they buy this pen of cattle or this lot of cattle, uh, when they evaluate what they think the quality grade and yield grade of that of that pen is going to be, what what do they think the cattle are worth based on that? And that's going to affect how much they give for them in a, in a live weight uh, per pound. So. I think it's kind of important that we kind of understand the grid formula pricing to kind of help us understand how live cattle uh, are priced. There's been some controversy with uh, the four big packers uh, and you know some people think that they've got a monopoly on the market. And I think you can find cattle producers on both sides of the coin here, but there has been quite a bit of legislation to give some transparency to the beef industry uh, from these packers. Uh, so there was one bill that was introduced called the 5014, and basically what that bill is uh, is trying to do is that 50% of all the cattle that are purchased by the, the four big packers are purchased through a cash negotiated bid. And the reason uh, the proponents of that would be that this would create some competition between them, and that would have a positive effect on price for beef producers. The 14 of that 5014 bill literally means that those cattle need to be delivered and slaughtered uh, within two weeks. Uh, so if we look at slaughter cattle grades in a grid formula price system, the carcass value is determined by three factors. Uh, and that is carcass weight, yield grade, and quality grade. So first we'll discuss uh, what these factors are, and then we'll describe how the grid formula prices are determined. So let's talk about carcass weight, one of those factors that determine what the value of a carcass is. And so if you look at the bottom left hand of this uh, slide, we had a 1,250 pound steer that yielded a 775 pound carcass. That's a dressing percentage of 62%. Now dressing percentage is different than yield grade, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. It is literally a comparison of the carcass weight compared to the animal's live weight. And that could be affected by several things. Uh, obviously, the stage and maturity of the animal, uh, the degree of muscling, obviously the heavier muscle an animal is, the higher dressing percentage we would expect the animal would have. Also, fat cover uh, is a, a big predictor of what the dressing percentage might be. Hide weight, the amount of fill that an animal has uh, when they're slaughtered. And if we bring in you know, calves that's got a lot of mud uh, on their hair coat, that's going to affect the hide weight. And packers typically don't like buying cattle uh, that are covered in mud because they're, if they're buying them live weight, they're literally given so much a pound uh, for the mud that's caked in their hide. 
Also, the scales they're weighed on, the hours of transportation before they get to the slaughter facility uh, can have an effect on dressing percentage. So if you look at the right, it's just kind of a range of dressing percentage uh, for beef cattle and dairy cattle. Uh, so the averages there for beef cattle you can see are 62 to 64%. They're a bit lower for dairy cattle and that's predominantly because they typically have less muscle on their carcass. So therefore they're gonna have a lower dressing percentage and they oftentimes are a little bit bigger middle and may have more fill on them uh, when they go to that slaughter facility. And then you can see there's a diagram that compares, is looking at the fat and muscle and how that affects the dressing percentage. Uh, so if, if we have uh, you know, cattle that have a, a lot of back fat, uh, that, that could affect their, their dressing percentage or cattle that are light muscled, that could have a negative effect on their dressing percentage. So the other uh, carcass quality thing is, uh, is the yield grade. And there are five yield grades according to the USDA, and they are one through five. One is the highest yielding, and five indicates the lowest yielding. So remember, uh, yield grade is different than dressing percentage. Yield grade is predicting the percentage of boneless or semi-boneless, closely trimmed retail cuts that can be uh, derived from that carcass. And so there's a mathematical formula that's used to calculate the yield grade. The four factors that go into that are 12th rib fat thickness, and it is literally what the fat thickness is over the ribeye at the 12th rib. And this is where the yield grade process starts. Based on that fat thickness, the animal is assigned a preliminary yield grade based on what that fat thickness is. And so if you look at the chart, the bottom right-hand corner, it's basically saying what the preliminary yield grade is. If a ribeye has absolutely no fat, totally free of fat, uh, at that 12th rib, ribeye has no fat, it starts with a preliminary yield grade of two. Then that yield grade is adjusted up or down depending on what the other factors are. So it can be adjusted for ribeye. So if that particular carcass has a larger ribeye, then that, that is gonna make that carcass higher yielding. If it has a smaller ribeye, it's going to make it lower yielding. We're also going to evaluate what the kidney and pelvic heart fat is, and that's expressed as a percentage of the carcass weight. And then hot carcass weight also affects the yield grade. So the USDA says if we have a 600 pound steer, it should have a ribeye area of 11 square inches. For every 100 pounds, that will affect the ribeye area requirement by 1.2 square inches. So if I have a 700 pound hot carcass weight, that carcass should have a ribeye area of 12.2. If the ribeye area on that carcass is smaller, that indicates that that animal is lighter muscled and therefore that would have a negative effect on yield and it would lower uh, the yield grade. So ribeye area is expressed in square inches uh, and so the picture here is basically of a grid in a large facility uh, that's done by a computer. We take a picture of that, and it's not only going to calculate the yield grade for that carcass, uh, it's also going to calculate the quality grade. Uh, but that's how it's done, and it's expressed in uh, square inches of the ribeye. The other factor that goes into calculating the yield grade is the kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. And uh, again, that's expressed as a percentage of the carcass weight. Absolutely no way to look at a live animal and predict what the kidney, uh, and know for sure what the kidney, pelvic, and heart fat is. So we use the external fat thickness as a good indicator of that. As you can see, if we've got a quarter inch of fat on this, uh, on this live animal, we're, we're going to assume that the KPH is somewhere between that one and one and a half percent of that carcass weight. You can see as the fat thickness increases, the percentage of kidney, pelvic, and heart fat increases as well. So here's just uh, some pictures of the five yield grades and notice that there's a significant amount of difference in the fat cover on all these uh, pictures. We're not, we're not looking at marbling here. We're not looking at quality. This just has to do really with lean to fat ratio and examples of, of, of the different yield graded carcasses of yield grades, which is predicting the amount of retail cuts that we'll be able to get from that carcass. Uh, 
then the other thing that we use in the grid formula is, is the quality grades. And there's two factors used to determine the quality grade of a carcass. One of those is marbling, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but there are nine degrees of marbling. And marbling is those little flecks of fat that we see in the ribeye known as intramuscular fat. The other factor that's used to determine the quality grade is a maturity group. And there are five maturity groups, A through E. A is the youngest, E is the oldest, and overwhelmingly the majority of cattle that we slaughter in the United States are gonna fall into the A, maybe a few more, a few might fall into the B category, uh, at least the animals that we're slaughtering for human consumption. So after we determine the marbling or what the degree of marbling is, and we determine the maturity, then those are combined to give us a final quality grade. And so there are eight quality grades of beef, prime choice, select, standard, commercial, utility, cutter, canner. And those first four are really designated for the young cattle that fall into that A or B maturity group. Uh, and then the other uh, quality grades are more designated for older animals that are obviously producing older carcasses. So this is a, a marbling card. Uh, so you see along the left, we have the degrees of marbling, nine of them from abundant all the way down to practically devoid. Across the top, we have our, our maturity groups, A through E. And so you just simply uh, read this like a chart. If I have a carcass that is A maturity and has a modest amount of marbling, that is a choice carcass. In this particular case, it would be an average choice. If it had a moderate degree of marbling and an A maturity, that would be a high choice. If it had a small degree of marbling and an A maturity, then that would be a low choice. And that small degree of marbling is really what the industry standard is. If we're going to get cattle to grade that uh, low choice, we need them to have that small degree of marbling when we pull them out of that feed yard and take them to the packing house. And that's what feeder calf grades are predicting. They are predicting how big will this animal be when it has enough marbling to get into that small degree of marbling category that will allow for that carcass uh, to grade low choice. So it's really a balanced beam between the quality grades and the USDA grades. So as the quality grade increases or gets better for a carcass, we can expect the yield grade to go down. And the opposite is true. If we have a real high yielding carcass, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for that carcass uh, to be uh, you know, a higher, higher quality. And so one chart here I've showed you is just the different breeds comparing the English breeds, the continental breeds, uh, some Zebu or Brahma breeds and dairy breeds and how much uh, external fat usually it takes for them to go ahead and fall into that choice category. And I mentioned this earlier, but if you look, for example, at the dairy type for a dairy animal uh, to get in that prime category, quite a bit less uh, back fat or external fat when we compare those to beef. There's a lot of people out there that say Jersey beef is, is the best beef to slaughter. And this would kind of support that a little bit, at least it's telling us that Jersey beef marble very well. Uh, so this just comparing the different types of, of animals with the fat thickness that does that. So here's some just rules of thumb regarding quality grade. Heavier muscled cattle uh, grade lower than lighter muscled cattle. It's simply easier to get a lighter muscle animal fat or finish compared to a heavy muscle animal. Thickness due to muscle usually results in a lower quality grade. Thickness due to fat usually results in a higher quality grade. Animals with a poor disposition that get excited uh, before slaughter can oftentimes lower their quality grade. Frame, frame size uh, related to fatness and weight can, uh, when determining a quality grade, for example, if I have a, a large frame steer at 1,100 pounds, uh, we will have a lesser chance of it grading choice than a smaller frame steer that weighs 1,100 pounds. Implants can have a negative effect on, on quality grade as well. So here's the pricing methods that we talked about, how we can sell these cattle, either live weight, dress weight, or grid pricing. And so uh, traditionally pricing systems, live and dressed, don't take into consideration the value of an individual uh, pen of cattle. So when those buyers show up to a feed yard, if they're buying live or dressed, 
They're buying usually multiple pins, multiple loads, multiple lots of cattle. Uh, because the packer has to assume the risk of, of figuring out whether those cattle are any good or not, uh, generally they're going to lower that, their price and they're also going to establish that price based on what they think some minimum averages for quality and yield grade might be for these cattle uh, that they're buying. Now we compare that, uh, you know, the burden of risk for cattle performance on the rail is transferred to the feeder or whoever's selling those uh, because the packer is not going to pay them for the live weight or the dress weight. They're paying them for how well those cattle do in terms of quality grade and, and yield grade. So if you look at the chart, we've got the three methods, uh, value-based, I could get a premium or discount if I'm selling my cattle on a grid or formula basis. Uh, the pricing unit uh, for live to dress, they're buying a whole pin, a, a couple of pins or lots. Grid, they're paying that seller for each individual carcass, depending on how well it performs in terms of quality grade and yield grade. Because of that, there is a high price variability among animals sold on the grid formula pricing. Uh, the pricing location uh, is at the plant. If we're selling them at a dressed weight because we're, we're getting paid for the carcass weight uh, and if we're selling them on a grid formula. Obviously, if we're buying the cattle live, then the pricing location is at the feedlot uh, or an auction. And so prices that reflect meat yield. If we're buying cattle live, we're estimating what that's gonna be. If we're buying uh, cattle for dressed weight, then we're basing that strictly off the carcass weight and its dressing percentage. If we're buying cattle on a greater formula, then we're going to be paid a premium or discount based on what uh, the yield grade is. And so you can see the price, uh, the base price can vary quite a bit with a grid formula. Uh, carcass performance risk. Uh, if, if I'm the seller uh, on grid formula, I assume the risk. And in the other two methods, that packing house buying those cattle, they're buying them live or they're buying them based on their dressed, dressed carcass weight, but they're making a prediction of how well they're going to perform in terms of quality or yield grade. So what kind of premiums can producers get and what kind of discounts? Well, if you look at this, this is a slaughter cattle report from Monday, February the 8th. If you look at the quality grade here, uh, the simple average was uh, $14.39 uh, per hundredweight. There was a high, meaning there was a, at least one prime carcass that received a $28 premium per hundred. And if you notice the choice category, there's no premium or discount. That is the industry standard. That's where they expect cattle to come in at. If you look at select and standard, then those there's a discount for those carcasses. If you look below, there's some other premiums. Uh, CAB is certified Angus beef. Uh, we can get a premium for all natural. NHTC is hormone free beef. Uh, we can get a premium for that. And then you can see we're getting some discounts for dairy type, bullock stab, a stag, uh, hard bone, dark cutter, or cattle that are older. And so let's look at yield grade then. If we look at yield grade, we're getting a premium as you can see for those yield grades uh, one, one through two. Uh, if we get them in that three category, we're not getting a premium. We're not getting a discount because that's where we expect them to come in. That's what the industry standard is. If they're lower yielding in that and fall into that yield grade four and five, you can see there's a discount. And then carcass weight. You can see there's a discount in it of anything below a carcass weight of 600 pounds. There's a discount of anything above 900 pounds. In the United States, our beef industry is based on a box beef program. So, if we get a carcass that has a carcass weight under 600 pounds, we're simply producing a retail cut that's smaller than what the American consumer demands. If we get a carcass over 900 pounds, we run into a couple of issues. First of all, those carcasses are harder to handle in the packing houses, and we may end up with a particular wholesaler primal cut that is too big or too large to fit in the box of our box beef program. So therefore, it's gonna be discounted because it's gonna to have to be cut up and used in different ways. So I thought this picture was a good one just to show you that cattle do grow different. At one point in time, these two calves uh, were probably the same size, uh, you know, when they at least started, were first born. 
you can certainly see a huge difference in conformation here. Don't know what the weight of these calves are. It may be similar, it may be way off, uh, but I just want you to look at how they're made so differently in terms of their conformation. And this is because of growth and development, not because of what they weigh. So I just want to show you some examples of live cattle and, and what uh, they might look like in terms of these yield grades. And so here's a calf that would be a good example of a yield grade number one. Uh, we don't see any real indicators here that this calf's starting to put on any fat and it's awful heavy muscle. And so that's going to make it a high yielding carcass. This may be a steer that's going to have a hard time reaching that low quality grade uh, carcass when, when we go ahead and harvest it. But it's a good example of a yield grade number one. Here's a good example of a yield grade number two. First of all, we might just note this calf's a little bit lighter muscled, lacks the muscle shape of the first steer we saw. One that's starting to get just a little easier fleshing look or smoother over its top line and rib, which is an indication it's got some fat cover. And if we look right there through that brisket, we're starting to get some uh, evidence of fat, fat depositing going on there. Here's a yield grade number three. Uh, again, one that falls in that industry standard. This is a steer that I wouldn't say was finished yet in terms of having enough fat cover, but uh, one that's a good example of a yield grade number three. Here's a yield grade number four. We can see quite a bit more evidence of fat as we look through the brisket over the top line. You look down through this lower rib, we're not seeing indication of, of those ribs. They're completely covered up with fat. Uh, so here's one that is going to be fairly low yielding by the time we figure out how many pounds of boneless closer trim retail cuts we get because there's going to be a little bit more trim here. And then here's a, a good example of a yield grade five. And obviously, uh, if you want to know what a, an animal that has some fat condition on it looks like, this is a good example. One that's very fat and distended through its brisket and just really every place you want to look uh, looks like it's got some finish and fat cover on it. Maybe a very high quality grade carcass, but it's going to be very uh, low on the yield grade side. So let's look at some quality grade. Here's a here's a standard quality grade. This calf, uh, this steer here, you can see was for sure a large frame feeder calf score. Great big old tall thing. I can I can see, especially in the lower rib, I can see some evidence of those ribs there. Just don't see a whole lot of indication there's much external fat. Because there's not that external fat and that 0.4 to half an inch, uh, this animal's not mature enough, not began to deposit fat inside that uh, ribeye area. So if you look at the ribeye, we have very little evidence of, of marbling in that ribeye. Now here's an example of one that would fall into the select grade. If we look there at the ribeye, that's the uh, minimum or some marbling, the minimum amount of marbling we need to be in this uh, USDA select quality grade. Here's a good example of a choice grade. Uh, and again, I think this is a good example of what we we're talking about earlier. This is probably not the heaviest muscle steer in the world, but uh, because it's not, it uh, makes it a little bit easier to put on some fat and therefore fall into this uh, industry standard we'd like every slaughter animal to be at a USDA choice. And here's a good example of a prime. Uh, this animal's got a significant, probably, a significant more amount of external fat over that 12th rib, uh, but because of that, it's got a lot more intramuscular fat or marbling, and as we've seen earlier, will bring a whole lot more money in the market uh, with those premiums if it's sold on a grid and formula price. So that's my presentation on feeder cattle and slaughter cattle grades. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to me. Uh, there's my contact information. And again, I thank you for joining us to, tonight for our winter Ozark Ag Series.